This is Steel Wolf. You can turn it into a mini fireworks show with this little bad boy. But how is it possible that metal can combust? This is my PhD in chemistry, and this is the combustion of steel wool not taught in college. Combustion. It's not just what happens to my sanity when I see Elon Musk try to translate his thoughts into words. I, I mean, I, it's a chemical process where stuff reacts rapidly with oxygen, releasing energy in the form of heat and light. Wait, metals can burn? Yep. While we usually think of combustion as something only flammable materials like wood or Biden's second shot at the presidency can do, metals can get in on the action too under the right circumstances. First, let's talk steel wool, then we'll get to the battery. Steel wool is basically a bunch of thin iron strands woven together, kind of like a metal loofah that got really ambitious. If you're wondering why we call it steel when it's mostly iron, you need to play a little bit more RuneScape. Steel wool has some superpowers though, not the kind that we usually think about, but the ones that get chemistry nerds like me a little bit hyped up. Some of his special powers include a high surface area to volume ratio. More surface area means more places for reactions. Think of it as crazy X's. The more you have, the more chances there are your life is gonna go up in flames. Next, we have a low thermal mass. Translation, these thin metal fibers heat up faster than Trump when you degrade his rallies. People don't leave my rallies. And lastly, oxygen accessibility. Its porous structure allows oxygen to mingle freely. It's the open office plan of the metal loofah. So here's the thing, it all comes down to one fiery reaction. 4Fe plus 3O2 going to 2Fe2O3 plus energy. I know, it's something straight out of a high school test that you've probably repressed, but trust me, it's about to get exciting. First off, that energy isn't just appearing out of nowhere. Physics 101, energy can't be created or destroyed, right? So where does it come from? Redox, baby. Let me paint you a picture. Iron, our hero, and oxygen, our villain, are engaged in the ultimate electron tug of war. This is known as a redox reaction, short for reduction oxidation. In one corner, you have iron, Fe, happily minding its own business, but ready to lose a few electrons like a mean girl losing fat friends when it's no longer convenient for her, and become a positively charged Fe3 plus ion. In the other corner, we have oxygen, O2, the electron thief. So electronegative, it's basically the skinny dude of the periodic table. Always on the prowl for those thick electrons. The iron undergoes oxidation, losing its electron like a snake shedding its skin. Fe going to Fe3 plus plus three electrons. Iron's like, take my electrons, I don't want them no more. And oxygen's like, me damn, I'll take them. And greedily snatches up those electrons in a process we call reduction. O plus two E going to O two minus. It might sound a little one-sided, but it's chemistry's version of balance. Oxygen takes those electrons and turns into a negatively charged oxide ion. And bam, they latch onto those iron ions like they've been waiting for this moment their entire lives. The result, iron three oxide, or as common folks call it, rust. This isn't your papa's slow rust. It's rust on steroids, igniting faster than the hot Tua girl going viral. All right, so now we know how the electrons are doing their thing, but where does all that energy come from? Here's where things get hot, literally. In iron, the electrons are sitting at a higher potential energy level. They're like toddlers hyped up on sugar, and oxygen's like the responsible parent, bringing them down. When those electrons move from iron to oxygen, that difference in energy level is released as energy, and in this case, that energy's heat. It's like the universe saying, thanks for that energy donation. Now here's a little fire, but that's not all. When iron and oxygen bond, they're forming one of the strongest bonds in chemistry, in an ionic bond. And guess what? Forming those bonds also release energy because atoms are happiest when they're in a lower energy state. All right, let's get to the aftermath of our fiery experiment. You see this leftover gray gunk? That is the iron oxide. Compare that to the silvery stuff. That's just the iron pre-combustion. You can kind of, you can see the difference here qu quite clearly. It's the steel wool's final form, fully evolved. But unlike when you burn wood or paper, this bad boy sticks around. And here's the cool part. It won't burn again. You can try sticking a battery to it, or even with a lighter or a flamethrower, and it won't reignite. Why? Because it's fully oxidized. Another crazy thing is if you were to weigh the steel wool before and after, it would weigh more, 30 to 40 percent more. The oxygen from the air latched onto the iron atoms, making them heavier. However, this weight is dependent on the extent of the oxidation. Lastly, the factors at play. Now, not all steel wool is created or burns equally. There are a few key factors that determine if your steel wool is gonna turn into a fiery inferno or just a dud. First up, the purity of the iron. The cleaner the iron, the better the burn. Purities are like ads and podcasts. They just slow things down and piss you off. Come on the podcast, check it out. What do you say when you get the f out of here? So if you have some high purity steel wool, you're gonna get a spicier reaction. Next up is the oxygen level. The better the oxygen supply, the better the reaction. So we got two pieces of the fine steel wool and we're gonna combust them without a fan and with a fan to show how increased oxygen levels affects the combustion. Lastly, fiber thickness. 
And yes, folks, size does matter. The thinner the fibers, easier the reaction is to start. Thinner steel wool means more surface area for the oxygen atoms to stick on. Finest, second finest, thickest. Now we're gonna see how well they burn. Fire, fire, fire. No fire. Fully combusted, getting there doesn't want to burn. So what's happening with this 9 volt battery that's initiating this reaction? Touching the battery's terminals to the steel wool creates a short circuit. Not the kind that fries people's brains when they contract TDS, but the kind that gets electrons partying through the iron's fibers. Electricity is just the flow of electrons, aka electrons moving from point A to point B. And when you touch the battery's terminals to the steel wool, it's like opening the floodgates for those electrons. But the party isn't free. The steel wool puts up some resistance. You can think of this resistance as the electrons colliding with the atoms of the metal themselves. Those atoms are like bouncers at clubs, slowing things down. Every time one of these electrons bumps into one of these pesky atoms in the steel wool, a tiny spark of energy gets released. Now you can't see these sparks unless you're a subatomic particle, and in that case, I say hi. But you can definitely feel them as heat. It's like a mosh pit in there, which causes the atoms to vibrate with excitement. And before you know it, the steel wool is heating up really fast. And here's where things get really spicy. The heat cranks up the temperature of the steel wool so much that it surpasses the activation energy needed to start a combustion reaction. That activation energy is largely to overcome the iron oxide coating around it and get to the inner iron that can be oxidized. And the chemical showdown begins. And once it starts, it doesn't stop until all the fuel's gone. Kind of like me binge eating Hagen dots. You might be thinking, cool sparks, bro, but where am I actually going to use this or need this? Well, besides impressing your friends or making your neighbors think you lost it, this experiment actually does have some survival value. Ever forget your matches or maybe they got wet camping? Just grab some steel wool and a battery that you didn't forget, obviously, and you got yourself a fire starter. But let's actually see if this will light some paper on fire. All right, maybe it's not the world's best fire lighter. I'm not even sure if it could start a fire. Well, let's be honest, if you're relying this in a zombie apocalypse, you probably should rethink your plans. But in a pinch, it might work, and it's definitely better than rubbing some sticks together. Peace.